you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, conference within the AI and Blockchain Summit, which will delve into the very relevant role which the European Union plays in the technologies shaping our future. The major added value of the upcoming two debates is that they will bring to you the legislators. Indeed, we have with us three Maltese members of the European Parliament today who have all shown a keen interest and direct involvement in this fascinating area, an area which has a huge influence on our daily lives, even though at times we may not even realize that. The European Parliament adopted in October 2020 three legislative resolutions on AI covering ethics, civil liability and intellectual property and asked the European Commission to establish a comprehensive and future-proof European legal framework of ethical principles for the development, deployment and use of AI, robotics and related technologies. Against this background, the European Commission unveiled a proposal for a new Artificial Intelligence Act in April 2021. The Commission proposes to enshrine in EU law a technology-neutral definition of AI systems. It proposes as well to adopt a different set of rules tailored on a risk-based approach with four different levels of risks. The AI Act, the first law on AI by a major regulator anywhere, seeks to promote trustworthy AI. It attempts to regulate a wide range of AI applications, aligning them with EU values and fundamental rights through this risk-based approach. The scope, instruments and governance framework introduced by the proposal are currently being debated and refined by the European co-legislators, the Council of the European Union and the European Parliament. Both have proposed possible amendments to the regulation with potentially far-reaching impacts on its overall scope and content. Work in both institutions has reached a very advanced stage. Once the two institutions will finalize their respective positions, they will then enter into negotiations between them and the European Commission. And it is perhaps ambitious, but possible, that by mid-2023 we will see this regulation being, being agreed upon and adopted. This will of course depend on whether the co-legislators converge on key issues such as the definition of AI, the risk classification and associated regulatory remedies, governance arrangements and enforcement rules. The Act has been presented as a horizontal piece of legislation, even if several limitations and exemptions apply. This, combined with the expected impact of AI on the economy and society may lead to overlap with several legislative provisions, both horizontal and sector specific. So there will surely be a lot to be discussed. Today we will have the privilege of hearing firsthand about the legislative process undergone by the proposal within the European Parliament. Since MEP Josian Kotayar, who will be taking part in the second debate today, is actually the rapporteur who wrote the opinion of the Transport Committee to, to the European Parliament's report. This therefore presents us with a unique opportunity to delve into and hear about the legislative process directly, and I am sure that Josiane will provide us with some very interesting and uh, extremely interesting insights. In the first debate, we will have MEPs Alex Ajus Saliba and Cyrus Engerer. MEP Ajus Saliba, Vice President of the Socialists and Democrats, has been coordinating a cross horizontal digital strategy for the political group across different committees in the European Parliament. In his role, he has pushed for a new social contract for the digital age, which clearly, with clearly defined digital rights that protect our citizens and offer opportunities to everyone, highlighting the need that the European digital agenda must have a social dimension, putting people at the center of the digital transformation. MEP Cyrus Engerer has been vocal in his support for harmonized rules aimed at regulating the field of artificial intelligence across the EU, and in calling for existing EU legislation concerning the sector to be amended to meet today's challenges. Cyrus has consistently called for the protection of workers' rights in light of the spread of automation in several sectors and industry, and for the protection of manual work as well due to the advancement of automation and AI in the workforce. Today, our MEPs will discuss with specialist practitioners, regulators, academics, and representatives of the business community, which I thank for having accepted our invitation in this unique setup, and I hope that you, an audience with a particular direct interest in these areas, will find these debates insightful and especially interesting. The way we approach artificial intelligence will define the world we live in the future. The perfect time and venue to discuss it is here and today. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mario, for that introduction. And without further ado, I'd like to start hearing from our panelists. I'd like to start from the two MEPs that we have on stage. I'd like our audience, both here and also those that are, are, are seeing us and listening to us, I'd like them to understand, first of all, what is the approach of the EU to AI, blockchain, and other maybe uh, emerging technologies. And also maybe um, Mario was mentioning your role in various things. I, I would also like to understand if there was a role in what is happening, what has happened, and what will happen. Maybe you give us a bit of introduction. I start, I'll start with you, Alex. So first of all, thanks for uh, inviting us. And I believe that this is a very timely discussion that we are having today. Because right now, when it comes to AI especially and the AI Act, we are having deep conversations within different committees. In fact, there are eight different parliamentary committees which have eight. Um, opinions or are the primary committees. The primary committees when it comes to the Artificial Intelligence Act are the Internal Market Committee. I am a member, a full member within the Internal Market Committee and the LIBE Committee, which is tackling the issues uh, of fundamental rights and safeguarding the fundamental rights and freedoms of our citizens within the AI processes which are affecting our everyday lives, our daily lives in different processes yeah. from health, from biometric data which is being used without our knowledge and also from the use of platforms and algorithms which are gathering a lot of personal data to ultimately bombard us with advertisement. What are we doing at this stage? First of all, my direct involvement in this process, apart from submitting a number of amendments within the Internal Market Committee to put people at the very center when it comes to AI and its applications, I am coordinating uh, nine different committees and nine different working groups within the SND structures as vice president of the group, okay. uh, coordinating the digital policy to be able to basically within all of these committees see that the fundamental principles and priorities of the SND family, which basically I can all join them in one pillar, which is having a human-centric approach when it comes to AI, are respected throughout this legislation. We have an opportunity at EU level to be standard setters when it comes to AI. We will be the first continent legislating directly to implement our values, our principles in the use of AI. We have a golden opportunity as we had with the DSA, with the DMA, as we had with the GDPR, where ultimately we were standard setters, not only within the EU, but our principles were also exported in other continents. So this is a great opportunity. We are having great discussions ultimately to have a solid text, a future-proof text, ultimately to be also more competitive, and we take it up to a further notch. We, we are leaders when it comes to research, when it comes to innovation, but we are lagging behind both in AI and also in blockchain when it comes to scale-up. So we need to protect our fundamental rights, but at the same thing, we have to channel the right investments. The tools are there, Horizontal Europe, um, uh, the AI and blockchain fund, but ultimately we have to channel these resources within um, the right within the right opportunities that are basically happening as we speak in different member states. So creating the ecosystem at EU level, but ultimately helping the innovators, uh, the startups at member state level to be able to compete not only uh, on the EU stage, but also at, at the international stage. Thank you, Alex. Uh, I'll pose the same question uh, to, to Cyrus. Uh, one particular thing which it is very much at heart and of interest to me is we say that the EU is a pioneer, but then we see what the US are doing, what China are doing, uh, which we not always agree with what they're doing, but they are doing it. So uh, how, how, what is the EU doing? But first, I would like to understand from you, Cyrus, even uh, the, um, the approach, the general approach to, to emerging technologies of the EU from, from an, an, an MEP point of view. 
Yes, um, thank you, first of all, and I'm happy to be here with you all. As, as Alex said, and he mentioned earlier on, the European Union is pi pioneering when it comes to actual legislation on artificial intelligence. At the same time, the European Union is pioneering in many other fields, for, among them human rights and the protection of the environment and the, fly, the fight on climate change. And that is where my role comes in in the European Parliament. Alex mentioned the LIBE committee, uh, of which I am a member, as well as the ENVI committee. So okay. when it comes to the environment and public health, then I am a full member of that committee. And my role within those committees would be to see how any legislation that we have on anything, including artificial intelligence, first of all, safeguards uh, the fundamental rights uh, of all European citizens, which is important. Uh, at, the, at the same time, we need to see that we can use AI in the fight uh, against climate change and to protect our environment. And I think that this is very timely, as currently, uh, as you know, in Sharm el-Sheikh, there's a COP27 conference yeah. going on, discussing uh, the way forward on climate change. And undoubtedly, in order for us, as a European Union, but also globally, to achieve our um, ambitions and to achieve our goals when it comes to climate and the environment, we do need artificial intelligence, because with artificial intelligence, we'll have a more uh, speedy and more timely way of achieving our ambitions, but at the same time, we will also have a more effective way of doing this. So whether we're speaking uh, of water, for instance, when it comes to uh, the environment, the agriculture, and using water efficiently, if we're speaking of the way that we build our our roads, our road infrastructure for our transport and in order to have the most effective and efficient and the most uh, infrastructure that would lead to the less emissions, we do need artificial intelligence. And, and I keep, can keep going on from one sector to another, but in order to have those benefits, we need legislation that first of all allows us to achieve that, but at the same time that safeguards also um, those issues which might arise because of artificial intelligence. We have mentioned uh, fundamental rights, we have mentioned data protection um, of all European citizens, but then I could also go into the environment as well, because as we know, artificial intelligence and its usage um, is very energy, um, consumes a lot of energy itself. And therefore, we need to see that whilst we balance um, the way uh, that uh, we use artificial intelligence in order not to um, use a lot of energy consumption. At the same time, we need to develop our artificial intelligence in order to reach our goals. Finally, um, I think that one important uh, issue that we're currently dealing with at a European Union level, we have devoted 20 billion euros in order to well, address artificial intelligence and reaching our Green Deal objectives. And we need to make use of all those 20 billion euros in order to reach not only our objectives, but to be the first globally uh, when it comes to AI, but also combine that with the protection of our environment and the fight against climate change. Thank you, Cyrus, for that. And I think even I sort of that um, I don't consider some, I, I'm not considered someone that follows what's happening in the EU Parliament, but I understood the approach. Uh, the next thing I would like to do, I would like to bring uh, Kenneth and Man Martis into the discussion. I'd like to bring um, the discussion to Malta, and and the reason I'll explain why it's not it's not because we're in Malta. Uh, this is an, an international conference, and a lot of um, people I've, I've met in the last five years, five years, five days, five days, ask me uh, why Malta. What are you doing in terms of AI and blockchain? And this, what happens in the European Parliament, trickles down into uh, into all the countries into all the EU states and more importantly trickles down to all businesses and all citizens. I'd like to start from you, Kenneth. Um, as the CEO of the Malta Digital Innovation Authority, MDIA, how do we trickle down what's happening at, at, uh, the, at the European Parliament stage uh, to Malta? And after that, I'd like to hear from, uh, from Martes here, who is from the Malta Chamber, how, we, how the businesses are affected. But first, like, let's take Malta as, a, as, a, as an example country that has to, uh, has to apply, for example, the EU, EU legislation. Yeah. 
Well, first of all, it has been reassuring um, to see how the uh, principles that Malta adopted early on um, in regulating innovative technologies, because as you might know, Malta in 2018 um, has enacted a law in certifying um, innovative technologies. First, we started from DLTs and then um, to also we, we have white in this spectrum to, to AI as well. And it's, let's say, that that same uh, adoption uh, find their way um, to NEU, NEU level. Um, uh, in fact, this, the risk-based certification approach that we adopted um, is very similar to, um, uh, to the approach which EU is, is taking. So, uh, for example, uh, there is another um, important aspect in the EU Draft Act, which uh, mentions the use of technology assurance and boxes, um, or regulatory and boxes. Uh, in Malta, we already have that type of uh, sandbox, um, which is there to, to assist uh, the startups and also scale-ups in, in um, testing their particular product in, within a regulatory environment. Um, so I would say that Malta is well prepared for, for the EU Act. The difference is that our our legislation is, is uh, voluntary, whilst the EU Act now will make it um, obligatory, mandatory. So um, for us, for sure, these four, year, four years um, serve to be uh, a good uh, yeah. learning experience. Thank you, Kenneth. Uh, obviously, um, we can do a million legislations, but then it always boils down to the people in the streets, to the entrepreneurs, to the businesses. Uh, I just heard from Kenneth that the EU is doing this, Malta did it optional, and the EU is obligatory. So this legislation is going to fall on the laps of entrepreneurs. Um, so I'd like to hear from you, um, how does this affect you, and also what the Malta Chamber is doing in terms of what, they, what you did and what you plan to do in, in, in all this? So, good afternoon, everyone. For the foreigners, welcome to Malta. Um, uh, for us, digitalization and the take-up of tech is, is key. So, in fact, for the Malta Chamber of Commerce, digitalization is one of our five main pillars in our for policy formulation. Our five main pillars, obviously, the first one is economic growth, because businesses are here to grow and make profits, so it's uh, one of the prime things that we advocate. But economic growth, the way we see it, is um, substantiated by another four pillars. The first one being sustainability, the second one being digitalization, the third being human capital, and the fourth being governance. Um, and I would say that we are very lucky as a, as a country because successive um, legislatures, we have seen investment in the tech industry. So if we look at it from the foreign direct investment point of view, we offer a number of incentives which rank us among uh, the most attractive even worldwide. But apart from that, we are also a very good sounding base for pilot projects. So this is one of the areas where our smallness is actually an advantage. Because coming to Malta, developing your tech, developing your solutions, you can actually test it on an entire country. Um, but apart from that, as I was saying, in 2018, we saw the introduction of three laws which helped to increase also the take-up of tech in Malta. Primarily, we saw the, the founding of the Malta Digital Innovation Authority. Uh, we saw as well the VFA Act, the Virtual Financial Assets Act, and we also saw the ETAS Act. And obviously these keeps giving an impetus to the country. Now what do we do as the Malta Chamber? First of all, we have a business section which brings all the tech companies together. And in this business section we discuss what are the opportunities for the industry, 
what are the threats as well, and together we come up with policy, which then we take up to government for take up from their end. But apart from that, we also have a digital transformation committee. Now, what is the role of the, the, the digital transformation committee? The role of the digital transformation committee is to help companies embrace tech. So let's take, for example, the manufacturing industry. This is where AI and IoT have a very important role to play. And this is where the Malta Chamber comes in by getting the tech experts together with the manufacturing industry. And the way we look at it is that actually AI, IoT, digitalization um, will help us to achieve our goals. So what are the current hurdles that a company faces? There's the administrative work, which can be eased through the introduction of AI. There is the governance aspect of it, which again can be made easier through, govern through, through AI. There is also the operational process, which can be very well facilitated by the combination of IoT and AI. But maybe the most crucial point is also uh, another factor. Everybody is currently talking about ESGs. And if we look at scope three, this is where we need to push forward our AI and IoT. So the Malta Chamber is here to facilitate um, business coming to Malta. We are also here to help Maltese companies to grow. And we are also here to support our MEPs, who I have to admit are doing a fantastic job in Brussels. We have only a handful of MEPs, but they're as vociferous as the rest of their colleagues, and obviously also to help the local government uh, to keep coming up with incentives that are not only good for the local industry, but also for the international community that invests in Malta. Thank you, Marta. Before I move to Alexei, I know that you have to be at some other event soon. So I, I, I'm going to ask you like the next thing that I was going to ask you after. Then if you leave us, <laughs> it will be, at least we would have taken at least the, the, the short answer to this. But uh, you mentioned like your initiatives. Uh, I have two, two questions, which maybe even a, a quick answer would be uh, enough to, to get, to get um, your, your line of thought. Um, first of all, in terms of Malta, we have, you have the CEO of MDIA uh, next to you. Uh, Malta has a lot of organizations, both governmental and not, that are, are pushing. Um, we, we mentioned like legislation both in blockchain that we passed in 2018, 19, and AI, AI strategy. Uh, are we on the right track uh, in, in, in terms of the opinion of the chamber? And if not, can we, ch can we do better? Can, what can we change in terms of from the opinion of the Malta chamber? So every ambitious person would say, it is never enough. I so, agree. <laughs> so I believe that we are doing good, but we can be greater. So if I were to highlight some of the positive things which I believe we're doing as a country, first of all, we do see a lot of support from government, particularly when it comes to access to funding. So if you were to look at the current funding schemes available, both for a small, medium and even um, in certain aspects, large SMEs, the help is there to help companies grow, both to develop tech systems, but also to help other companies like the tourism industry, the manufacturing industry, the retail industry to grow and to take on board more AI solutions, more IoT solutions. Um, we are also seeing an increase in the appreciation of R&D, which I believe plays a crucial role even in the take-up and in the advancement of tech. Of tech. What can we do better? Obviously, we would like to see a heavier investment in R&D, and we would like to see a commitment over a period of years, um, a commitment which is established at budget stage and which would also ideally bind uh, successive governments. And if I were to give one suggestion, one takeaway which we can take from here, is that I think that it's time that even when we look at R&D, we differentiate between R&D which is blue sky and R&D which is more intended agreed, for agreed. the businesses. So that would be my main takeaway today. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Martes. I'd like to move to Alexei. Um,
First of all, obviously, you're a professor at the University of Malta, so you're part of the education system. Um, you're also in AI, which is a vast subject. Uh, there are, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an industry that changes very fast. So, okay, education is one of the things that we can tackle in terms of in terms of how to tackle all this that is actually happening. But also, I would like to ask both you and also the other panelists, what else can we do? We mentioned a bit sandboxes. I'd like to have a, a two, three things that we can do to 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 tackle this this fast moving uh, how to handle this this fight. But I'd like first to get uh, your thoughts. Um, and both of you actually on, on the education side of things. Okay, um, so thank you, Johan. Um, I think education is, is, is the key for everything. Um, unfortunately, even from the work which I've done, uh, even as part of the Malta.ai national strategy, it is very clear that even though people um, throughout Malta had heard about AI, but in reality, when you come to the, um, uh, to, to the basic elements, very few know much about it. And here I'm talking about both, um, I mean, from the educational side, but also from the, from the commercial companies, etc. And uh, that is part of the problem, because, I mean, if you don't know enough about what you're trying to tackle, I mean, how can you expect to get the benefits out of AI? And I think that's the first step. Um, the second is, is something which I'd also like to link, um, Johan, to what you said before. Um, if you look at the other continents and countries, you see that you know they're they're quite advanced especially compared to us but uh, something which both Alex and Cyrus said before they mentioned repeatedly the issue of rights and I think that's a very important element which let's not discount it when I see some some case studies of what's happening in other countries the US China etc really and truly it's you know it's a wild west of AI over there and I've heard some pretty horror stories a person quite quite um, uh, quite famous that um, uh, he applied for for uh, banking services um, he has a shared account with his wife he got I don't know 10,000 credit limit his wife got 2,000 credit limit why it's obviously a bias issue on the AI worse still than that a person got arrested simply because the AI identified him at the crime scene. And, you know, th these are horror stories because if he didn't have um, uh, an excuse or, or, or a uh, an explanation where he was at the time of the crime, today he would be in prison. In the US, they have another system which practically decides the life of a person, whether he should be sent to prison or not. And even worse than that, these systems are commercial systems. So, you know, there's the commercial secret. They don't even have to tell you why you were sent to prison. So, so, so this is, in my opinion, the ridiculous situation that we have over there. So on one hand, it's true that, you know, there are these advancements. But hey, um, I think we have to be very cautious on, on the kind of safeguards which we need to implement. And that is why the, the EU legislation is extremely important. Because after all, if we do not create AI which, which serves us and which, which gives us the rights, then I think we're we're just, you know, wasting our time and, 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 and uh, nailing ourselves in a very bad position. And that is also why, you know, the sandbox is extremely important as well. Because the sandbox allows us to go and explore these, these capabilities um, uh, in a safe environment, of course. And I think this also links to, to the spirit of the Malta.ai national strategy. When the government launched in 2019, the, the spirit was that, listen, Malta can be an ideal launch pit because we have the whole dynamics of larger countries, but obviously at a much, much smaller scale. So you can try it over here within the safety of the sandbox provided by MDIA, and then of course you know you can you can you can uh, launch it to, to bigger markets. So I think it's a combination of a number of things, and the sandbox is extremely important because it allows us to develop not just AI but trustworthy AI, because that's the other side of the coin. On one hand we need education, but on the other hand we need AI which we can trust as well. Thanks, Alexei. Same comment from you, I don't need this. Um, just to clarify, when I meant AI, it's not university for everyone. What I meant is how do we educate businesses, how do we educate the person in the street to actually understand what an AI system can do or cannot do or shouldn't be able to do. So that, but I'll leave that comment to you, I don't need this. Thank you, thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation. 
I have to admit that for a legal academic, this is a rather privileged position to be. Why? Because I'm next to MEPs, next to the Maltese Authority, the people from the commerce area, and a colleague from the university who works on the technology, which are exactly the kind of people that legal academics need to hear before we make educated decisions about what is going on. Now, when it comes to the question, uh, how to better educate as regards AI, I think first and foremost, it is really important to take an interdisciplinary approach. The aids, where each one of us at the university or even at the market level was able to have the privilege of being secluded in his own area, I think is long gone. I think, I think the only way forward is that whether we like it or not, I know that lawyers are not usually welcome in uh, technology uh, conferences, uh, but whether we like it or not, we need to sit together at the same table and learn from one another. In fact, I'm really happy to hear from everybody in the panel that the protection of fundamental rights will be a priority. That has not always been the case, and that is not the case in other areas of the world as well, and that is an important victory for the European continent. In fact, it is this kind of thinking that uh, inspired us at the University of, Val of Malta, at the Center for Distributed Ledger Technologies, to run an interdisciplinary master's on blockchain. Hopefully we might expand it in the future, I don't know, but uh, in, in this master's, I need to understand how people from the technology and the business sector and, uh, think before I tell them what to do. I know that the natural reflex of a lawyer is to say you cannot do this or that before they hear what other people have to say, but we are trying to improve on that. Now, when it comes to uh, educating people outside of the university in order to uh, familiarize themselves with these technologies, I think that we need to be very careful. Why? Because exactly because these technologies refer to crucial fundamental rights, the process of understanding them can be painful. Infringements of fundamental rights are serious issues. And while fundamentally, for example, I'm not against the regulatory sandboxes, a regulatory sandbox works under the assumption that for a period of time we will accept violations of fundamental rights, violations we, which we cannot fully predict in advance. So, yes, we need to take a risk, but at the same time we need to be cautious with the risk that we are taking. And also, what is also important, I think, is that we need to be very realistic as regards our expectations uh, uh, from the technologies. Uh, AI especially has this unique ability to fascinate, to capture hearts and minds at the same time. And sometimes the expectations of the people go well beyond what the technology can achieve as we currently speak. I think one of the major uh, uh, um, achievements of the EU is that, especially in regulating AI, the legislator is taking account what the technology can do right now. It does not try to speculate on what the technology might be in the future. And that is an important starting point. But, uh, in addition to that, I would say that while we try to learn and uh, understand these technologies, we must uh, also always think what these technologies are good at doing. Because there is also the tendency, especially with emerging technologies, people to try to apply them in every given situation. But what I have learned after coexisting for the past two years with computer scientists is that technological solutions are not perfect for every kind of problem. Agreed. <laughs> Before we apply AI or blockchain, we need to first ask the question, do we really need them? And then proceed. Thank you, Ionidis. Um, I'd like to go back to the start. Um, uh, two main things um, I'd like to explore. Um, first of all, I'd like to link the approach of the EU back to the MEPs linking Malta and, and what is happening in, in, in Brussels, Strasbourg, and, and around. Uh, in terms of, we've heard from the businesses, we've heard from MDIA, um, 
Alex, Cyrus, in terms of Malta, in terms of opportunities, risks, how we're going to implement them, the, the effect on, on, on the citizens, on, 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 on the businesses. I'd like, now that you've heard like the other four participants, I'd like to get back to you to comment on what you heard and how do you link what you're doing in, in the European Parliament again to Malta. First of all, I am happy that we are very much on the same wavelength when it comes to where we want to go. First of all, what are our ambition, ambitions when it comes to what we want to achieve with the AI Act? I believe that we have three ambitions, three ambitions which were reflected in this panel. Uh, um, trustworthy AI, a reliable AI, and a human-centric AI. So putting our people at the very center when it comes to these, to these processes. When it comes to uh, what can we do better as a, as, a, as a country, I believe, and they always like to describe this, this, this issue, and I think that this is also a problem that we have at home, like it exists at an EU level. We, had, we have this EU uh, AI syndrome, I like to refer <laughs> AI to. AI syndrome. <laughs> which is, we are investing heavily when it comes to research level, and I'm seeing Alexei here, we were speaking before the start of this event, our, our, our university students are doing great work uh, at research level, but what are we doing post-research for that product that we are producing Commercialization to be able of... to be scaled up? And not only Malta is failing, our whole European ecosystem is failing. What are the biggest struggles that we are, fi that we are finding? Funding, but also the issue of data. Uh, we were speaking a lot about the issue of data. Uh, if we want to compete with the US, with, 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 with China, when it comes to scaling up, uh, these continents are very harmonized when it comes to uh, data. And you cannot have uh, AI systems and blockchain which can work, which is not powered uh, with data and data sets. It, it, it won't work. Agreed. And I think that one of the biggest setbacks that we have is the incompletion of the digital single market. We have been working for a number of years for the completion of the EU digital single market, but we haven't achieved our objectives yet. And unless we, we can have the AI Act and all the other acts and all the other legislative uh, instruments, all the legislative instruments in the world, but unless we have um, an ecosystem which works when it, when it comes to data, we ultimately are at a big competitive disadvantage uh, with US, US and China. And it is to no surprise that the 10 most successful companies when it comes to both blockchain and AI, we have no EU company ranking amongst, amongst these top 10 companies. But to tackle this issue from another point of view, more than half of these top 10 tier AI companies are companies whose business model is based on targeted advertisement. And I don't believe that the business model of targeted advertisement and collection of personal data without, and now I am again linking to the human-centric approach that we need and the risk-based approach, which is the fundamental pillar when you assess and analyze this AI Act that we are, that we are debating right now. I don't believe that this US and China model of basically collecting all this personal data from our citizens, from platforms which have become public utilities of our times, um, without their knowledge, sensitive data which is going against all data privacy and all uh, main <laughs> legislations protecting our fundamental rights. This should not be the business model which we should and must aspire to at EU level. Thank you, Alex. Cyrus, yes, uh, and final comments. We're yeah. soon running out of time, so final comments for all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To, to add to that, I think that uh, as a European Union, we're losing a lot of talent as well. We need to make sure that talent, we have seen, we have heard how the University of Malta is investing in a lot of students. At the same time, many other universities across the European Union are doing the same, but then we're losing this talent to the United States, Canada, United Kingdom, Japan, and Australia. This is not only the case on, an, 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 on AI, it's the case on everything else. And we need to have policies within the European Union to attract not only 
those people, citizens of the European Union to remain within the European Union, but also to attract third country nationals to come and work within our Euro European Union to be part of our success. Because if we do not manage to do that and others who we compete with are actually attracting all this talent, then we will fail. But also, let's make sure that when it comes to um, artificial intelligence and the research in artificial intelligence, we take human, a human rights approach from the beginning. A lot has been said on this. Let me give just one example. When it comes to um, platform workers, for instance, Uber, Bolt, uh, uh -huh. and so many others, when it comes to facial recognition, many a times all the research has been done on white men. And that is very problematic because not all workers are white, the bias that not Alexei all workers was... are males. And this is a very big problem in artificial intelligence. We know that we have had a number of workers in Uber, in Bolt and others who try to log in every morning for their day of work as workers and they are not recognized. They, have, they give all their full day of work, but then they do not receive their pay because they are people of color, for instance. And that is a very big challenge that we have. We cannot have artificial intelligence at place at the work at the workplace uh, in place at the workplace if this does not encompass everyone and that is something that we really need to take care of and we really need to invest in artificial intelligence for everyone thank you Cyrus Kenneth uh, quickly uh, we've heard multiple times human-centric approach MDIA and implementing a human-centric approach is something that uh, how do you implement it? As a, what's the role of the MDIA, for example, in implementing this human centric well, approach? Well, actually, I wanted to highlight two, two points which were mentioned. Yes, yes, yes. No, no, I'm, research, I'm just one of the points research, was this that I remember. Research and development, and um, the issue also of investment. Um, the European Union is working, is, is funding um, uh, a, par a particular project with, which addresses these challenges. It's the European Digital Innovation Hub which is a network, or a European network, whereby each country will have a number of um, DIHs. In, in Malta, we will have only one because we, we're small and, and it will be administered by the MDIA. Well, what's the aim of, of the Digital Innovation Hub? It's purposely uh, a place to, um, to give the expertise, the, 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 the space, the equipment okay. um, to scale-ups, to, to startups, to research, Okay. Uh, also due to academia, uh, because I didn't mention them, um, to research new, new technologies and also to try and to test uh, before they invest in those particular projects. So, so instead I of a virtual sandbox, it's an actual yeah. hub, a sandbox for moving, and commercializing, like Alex mentioned, the technology. And you, the European Union is funding such projects um, along Europe. Thanks, Kenneth. Uh, Martes, maybe final comments or Alexei? So in line with what we're saying, I believe that we need to ensure that we are continuously investing in digital skills and making sure that we are not only upskilling people, but we also need to look at the reskilling aspect to see what jobs will be lost and what will be taking it over. Thank you, Martes. Um, I'll, I'll just continue on Martes. Um, we're currently doing a project on the um, uh, human capital um, uh, with the HSBC Foundation and the Chamber of Commerce. And uh, one of the results which we got from, from employers is that in the coming years, 10% see that they will have a reduction in employees because of automation. 26% think that they, it might happen. So we're talking about 36% of employees are saying, listen, um, eventually, you know, we'll have have to downsize because of automation, so in increased efficiencies, etc. So, you know, what will happen in the future, I, I don't have the glass ball for that, but I can tell you one thing, is that there will be a lot of disruption, and now is the time to educate our children um, to create the future generation, but also the upskilling and reskilling of our workforce, so that we can embrace the, the challenges and opportunities, of course, of the future. Thank you. Thank you. Alexei? A very quick one from my end. The EU has chosen the difficult path in digital innovation. It has chosen the responsible path. And it is difficult because other competitors are not paying maybe the same level of attention to fundamental rights. But this path is difficult because usually the EU is accused about stifling innovation. 
I think, I think the reality is that the EU wants to achieve responsible innovation, but that's an elusive target. We might not be 100% there yet, but I can tell you that all academics, including legal academics, are working hard. Why? Because at the end of the day, we want to protect all fundamental rights. It's not only about privacy, it's not only about consumer protection, it's also about the right to conduct business. And I hope that we will find that balance. At least, I'm happy that the EU is keeping legal academics in IT law busy. I'm happy to be busy at that level. Thank you, Ionidis. Thank you all. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Cyrus, Kenneth, Martes, Alexei, and Ionidis. Thank you very much uh, for, uh, for your contribution. And now we're going to pass on to the second panel. In the meantime, we're also going to uh, see an address for, uh, from another MEP, but I'll tell you about that in a second. Thank you all.